Okay, so uh, I'm back to talk to you now about uh, nearest single object slitless spectroscopy mode. Um, so this is uh, similar to the bright object time series that uh, Stefan was just talking about. So the main use of this mode is going to be for uh, transit and eclipse of uh, exoplanets where you're getting uh, spectroscopy, uh, time resolved spectroscopy of the, uh, the star <laughs> system, such as in this picture here. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few of the specifics, the nearest here. So start off with the GRISMs, the spectral trace, uh, the operations concept, uh, the detector subarrays and readout modes. There's options uh, similar to what Stefan was just talking about. Um, the wheel repeatability. Um, talk about the faint and the bright limits. Uh, saturation, for example, and uh, how faint you can go with the host, the stars, and show you some example data. And then talk about uh, field star contamination because we're in a slitless mode here. And then talk about uh, spectral orders contamination. So, uh, show you this diagram again. It's the third time you've seen it today, so you should all be familiar with Neos's wheels. Um, so, in this case, uh, simpler than before, we are using the GRISM, the GR700XD, where XD stands for cross dispersion. And we use that, uh, so that's here in the pupil wheel. And we're using that with no filter at all here, using this clear position in the filter wheel. So, what is this thing? The Getting some echo coming through now. Oh, he's gone. Uh, okay, can you sort it out? So the, uh, the this grism, uh, this is a picture of it in, in its mount. And uh, the way that this grism is set up, here's a schematic of, of the grism. So we actually have two things uh, stuck together. There's a, a zinc sulfide prism and zinc uh, selenide grism. And basically, the light enters here. And on this surface here, there is a weak cylindrical lens. And what that does is provide a certain amount of defocus of the light path as it's coming in along, uh, along one direction only. And the reason we have this is that it then sp spreads the light out uh, as it comes into the system. And it spreads the light onto more pixels than you would have otherwise. So we have JWST with its fantastic PSF, which we're going to take a lot of work to get refocused every two weeks to make sure we always have a very good imaging PSF. But with this instrument, we're actually going to spread it out because we want the light to be falling on more pixels, and that allows us to have better uh, uh, minimize flat field problems and uh, basically let us reach a, a better saturation limit as well by putting it on more pixels. So this is similar to this uh, scanning mode that's been used on HST for exoplanet observations where you let the star spectrum drift across the field uh, during the observation to put the spectrum onto more pixels. So here we actually uh, just spread out the light using this weak cylindrical lens. And then, it come, then the light comes through and uh, it gets dispersed uh, also by the, uh, the grism and you get these traces that I'll show you in more detail in a better plot later. Um, so this spreading out of the light, uh, just to give you an idea of how much it is, Here's a picture, an image here from uh, the CV3 campaign of the PSF at a single wavelength. So it's a monochromatic source at 1,300 na nanometers. So the spectral direction is along here. So you can see that we still have very good spectral resolution uh, of uh, about two pixels for the path maximum, just like uh, you, you would have had without putting this, uh, uh, this weak lens in. But along the spatial direction here, we've spread the light out much more than the typical two pixels that you'd have. So from peak to peak, so you get kind of this double horned profile with a few wiggles in between in the spatial direction. So peak to peak, it's about 15 pixels. And if you want 99% of the light, you're looking at about 36 pixels. So this is what the data look like um, on, on the OA. So it's cross dispersed. So we get multiple orders appearing uh, spatially separated from each other. So the bright trace here in red is the first order. Uh, going all the way from the top of the detector down to the bottom of the detector. And then this fainter trace here that's mostly just green is the second order. And you'll see that that's whilst it's curved and it's well separated from the first order down in this region, um, but it actually merges into the first order up in this region. I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. And then you can see faintly in this data, uh, there's also a third order, which is not used for science because um, it's, uh, it's a lot weaker than the others. So uh, for subarrays, um, we have two different choices of subarray in this mode. 
Um, first of all, the larger subway is a 256 by 248. And so that basically encompasses, uh, so the black dashed line here shows you the, uh, the, the subway. And this shows you the, uh, the, the whole amount of the subway that includes all the orders. And so the wavelength range you get here using this uh, in the, uh, the first order goes from 830 to uh, 830 nanometers to 2816 nanometers. And the second order, uh, the blue end, gives you from 600 to 1409 nanometers. If you, uh, if you have a very bright source, then you can use a smaller subway and you can get a quicker readout time. So that gives you uh, a chance to get to a brighter saturation limit. So for the brightest sources, you may want to step down to the 96 by 2048 subway. And in that case, you're losing. So this shows you the outline of that subway in the black here, the black dashed line. So you're actually losing most of the second order in this case. And you're going to be limited to just having the first order for doing your science. But the benefit of that, if you're looking at a bright star, is that you gain about a magnitude in the bright limit. Uh, in terms of spectral resolution, um, so we're getting here quite a wide wavelength range, going all the way from 0.6 to 2.8 microns in one shot, um, without you needing multiple settings. Um, and the spectral resolution is pretty good as well. So uh, the resolution is, uh, so it's called GR700, because it's 700 at around about uh, just over a micron here. But uh, the re resolution, so this is 1,000 here, and this is 2,000 here. So the resolution is actually a fair bit higher over a lot of the spectral range. So this is a way you can get fairly high spectral resolution and get a large wavelength range all in one shot. Um, so in terms of the operations, uh, how do you actually go about getting your source uh, onto, the, onto the detector in the right place? Um, well, what we do is we do acquisition, uh, first of all. And for acquisition, we put in the non-redundant mask that Alex was talking about this morning that's used for the AMI imaging. Um, we use that just to cut down the amount of light that's coming in um, because the, these stars are typically very bright. You don't want to have something too bright in your detector for acquisition. And also use one of the narrower filters, the F4ATM, F4 and use a subway as well. And we make the acquisition point at this position here on the detector. And when we get the, sort the star into the right place here, then when you put the GRISM into, then you get the dispersion over here on this side of the detector. So this green outline here shows you the four amplifiers of the detector. Um, the acquisition would be a single pass acquisition. It should be good to about a tenth of a pixel. Um, you just take an image, measure that, measure that position, apply the offset to put it to your predefined location. Um, then put the GRISM in. And then the observing sequence is uh, you just do one long exposure, um, which contains a large number of integrations, which enables you to maximize the efficiency and also stops you having a loss of time between starting one exposure and uh, the next one. Um, now, as I mentioned, this is a slitless mode, and we have a 2.2 uh, arc minute field of view. So stars typically don't just come on their own in the universe. They tend to be associated with other stars. And so what this means is that you're going to get the light from the other stars coming into uh, the field as well. And there will be some contamination. Now, unlike the case with the wide field slitless I talked about this morning, typically the uh, exoplanet host star is the brightest star in the field. Um, that's where most of the flux is. And the other star, contaminating stars will be fainter. But there are cases where there's con there are other bright stars in the field. So one of the ways you can mitigate that is by changing the orientation so that the, the, the contamination, contaminating stars move around. So that's shown here, where if you look at the default position of putting this is your target star onto the sweet spot, then you get contamination, contaminating features like some of these coming into your spectrum as well. And But if you change the orientation uh, by 20 degrees or so, you can uh, get much cleaner spectrum where you don't get contamination from other things. Change it up to 35, then you start to get other contaminating sources coming in. Do you know what those little things are from? I mean, they don't look like the, the main spectrum. Um, they're probably, probably the zeroth order. Things like this, yeah. yeah. Um, so we do actually have a tool available that you can find on the University of Montreal website um, that lets you determine that if you change the the PA, it uses the two-mass catalog to tell you uh, what contaminating sources you have in the field. Um, another one of the things we found uh, is that the, uh, the wheels do not always come back to exactly the same position. And this will cause some tilt 
in the trace as you change from one, uh, from one time you move the wheels to the next. And this shows you basically that at the blue end of the spectrum here, um, the spectrum is basically in the same place every time you come back. But down at the red end of the spectrum, we get an offset here, and the offset is uh, basically up to uh, a pixel. And that corresponds to a very small rotation. But this will have to be taken into account when you're doing the calibration of working out exactly where the trace is. Um, for exposures, um, we have, uh, this is, uh, so basically, a lot's been said about the way that the detectors work already. So there's a reset bias level, and then your first read of the detector here, and then second read, et cetera, as you go on. So for very bright sources, you want to minimize the, the number of reads so you don't saturate. Um, so in the typical case where we have correlated double sample, if you're just going for uh, uh, up to the second read here, then your observing efficiency is 33%, because you're basically taking the difference of these two, but you're having to go for three time steps here. Um, so an alternative to that, if you want to get higher efficiency, would be to just use the, this, this known beforehand bias level that you don't directly measure for each exposure, but you assume it doesn't change over time. And then you just take one read and you subtract that off. And if you do that, then your efficiency goes up to 50%. Um, so for very bright sources where you're trying to keep, you want to get the efficiency high, but you want to keep the, uh, the time short so they don't saturate, you'd use that kind of mode. Um, so you get a brighter saturation limit, but the downside of that is that is this bias level always the same? There'll be some difference, so there'll be an extra source of noise due to the fact that the bias level changes. Um, in terms of the saturation limits we can reach, um, similar to what uh, Stefan just showed for near spec. Uh, so this shows a histogram of the expected uh, test uh, exoplanet host star magnitudes. Uh, K magnitude ranging from 5 here up to 15 here. And this histogram shows the expected distribution of them for super Earths in red and for Earth mass planets in blue. And the nearest saturation limit is around about 6 to 7 here. And the nearest faint limit, at which point your things beyond here are basically you're not getting enough signal to noise to be able to detect the uh, atmospheric features in your data. And this, this working range basically of nearest kind of nicely encompasses the expected magnitudes of these stars. Okay. Um, this just shows that data again. So this is basically showing you the noise you get in parts per million on your spectrum. And this is, so this is at full spectral resolution, showing you the full wavelength range here. So down at this end in the blue, this is the second order uh, information you're getting. And you can see that crucially gets you down to 0.6 to, to 1 micron range. Um, and then most of the information comes in the, uh, the first order, which is in red. And you can see how these curves change depending upon the brightness of your star. As the star gets fainter, then obviously your noise limit gets higher. And this is all for a four-hour clock time observation during a transit. Um, this is very busy. I won't go through all the details on this plot. But again, this is about the saturation limits, showing uh, different exposure uh, uh, parameters if you're using n group of one or n group of two, and it shows you how, how the saturation level changes with wavelength uh, for these different uh, for the different subarrays and uh, different orders and stuff. And then for different magnitude ranges in terms of the saturation level between eight and 5.5, there's a you know it tells you which number of groups you should use, which subarray you should use, and what kind of coverage you're going to get if you use those subarrays. And then here, there's also information about some of the details of which bits of the data you might be losing due to saturation or due to uh, other effects and uh, the bias drift uncertainty if you're using the uh, N group of one option. Um, so here's a completed simulation. If everything goes according to plan, this is the kind of data we're going to be getting. Um, it's absolutely spectacular. This is a spectrum of the atmosphere of a planet uh, similar to the one that's around this star. And this is, shows you here the transit depth. Uh, OK, so it's, um, it's a pretty small amount in terms of the, the spectral difference in the transit depth uh, as you go through. And you can see all these features. And so the, uh, the black line here is the model, so an, a model of what this, uh, the, the atmosphere of this planet might look like. And the red points, uh, 
for the first order of all the individual measurements with error bars uh, in the spectrum, and then the blue is the, uh, the second order measurements in the spectrum as well. So you can see this, this huge wealth of data, you, uh, information you get from all these different spectral features. You've got broad features uh, from the molecules and then uh, much narrower atomic features as well. And you're getting this whole wavelength range all in one go. Um, the spectral orders, uh, so there's this overlap problem where unfortunately due to the design of this uh, GRISM, we couldn't get the first and second order to be completely separated on the detector. So here again, showing you the, uh, the layout on the detector, just the, the upper half of this trace basically, um, where you can see that the second order here as it comes up and it starts to merge into the first order trace. And so there will be a bit of an issue in this region where you have to try and disentangle the two components of the spectrum. And this shows you the, uh, so for, for each of these locations over here, the other way up is the, uh, the trace of the first order in, uh, in red and the second order in blue. And you can see where, they, where it starts to become an issue and where you're going to get some contamination of these things. That, uh, and we need to model that and work out a way of uh, subtracting it or at least try and, trying to minimize the, the, the contamination effect there. Um, so in summary, um, this is a very powerful mode uh, for exoplanet transit spectroscopy. Uh, we cover this large wavelength range in one go and at fairly high spectral resolution. Um, the slitless design with this extended spatial PSF spreads light over more pixels, which has a lot of benefits in terms of the, the flat fielding errors and the saturation limit. Um, there's two subarrays and several different readout modes you can use depending upon exactly how bright the, uh, the target star is. And we're going to use a very stable operation mode of just using a very long exposure with many integrations in order to try to minimize some of the effects that have seen with the detectors when you're stopping and uh, starting the, de the detectors. And if you're interested in playing around and looking at what this data, what kind of data you may be able to get, there's simulation tools available at uh, this website, uh, jlst.astro.umontreal.ca. And coming soon to the Space Telescope website as well are simulation tools uh, for an ETC specifically for the Bright Object Time Series observations.